So, uh, this is the second lecture of this uh, course and this is the first lecture of module 1 that is soil exploration. So, before we uh, in the first class as I mentioned that uh, it is very uh, very uh, important to know the for behavior of the soil or the properties of the soil for design of the foundation. So, uh, uh, we should know what is the property of a particular site where this foundation uh, has to be constructed. So, in that way we have to go for the field test as well as the laboratory test and this uh, collectively all this test and methodology that will be discussed in this module 1 that is soil exploration. So, before we start what is uh, soil exploration that uh, should know the uh, definition or obviously of the soil exploration. The field and laboratory investigations required to obtain the necessary data for the site for proper design and successful construction of any structure is collectively called as soil exploration. The choice of foundation and its depth, the bearing capacity, settlement analysis depend very much upon various engineering properties of the foundation soils. So, we, have, we should know the various engineering properties of the foundation soil before we start the design of the foundation soil. As I mentioned the strength properties that in C5 is a very important properties for the foundation design of important properties of the soil for foundation design. Similarly, for the center settlement calculation also that uh, consolidation properties of the soil that also very important properties that we should know for the foundation design. Now, the primary objects of the soil explorations are the determination of the nature of soil deposit of the soil, determination of the depth and thickness of various soil strata and they are extend in horizontal direction. So, what is the depth and what is the thickness of the various soil strata that is very important for any foundation design. The location of groundwater table because groundwater table also play a very important role. So, obtaining soil and rock sample from various strata, the determination of the engineering properties of the soil and rock strata that affect the performance of the structure and determination of the in situ properties by performing field test. So, these are the objectives of soil explorations. Now, before we go for the, uh, for the soil exploration, we should know what are the uh, soil data required. So, soil data is required as I mentioned that means the soil profile that means the thickness and soil identification that is important. Then the index properties, the index properties mean that in the first lecture I uh, mentioned the index about the index properties like water content, aerobic limits, etc. Then strength and compressibility and characteristics or that means the C, C dash cohesion, then the cohesion, then undrained cohesion of the soil phi dash uh, friction angle or uh, internal uh, friction angle of the soil, angle of uh, then the CC compression in this OCR and over consolidated ratio. So, these things we should know. Then other is the location of the groundwater depth, the groundwater table where it is located. Then uh, first stages of site investigation. So, for the look for the currently available information, what are the information available? Uh, before we start our soil exploration. Then the aerial photographs, if it is available, we will collect that. Then topographical maps, if it is available. Then existing site investigation report for nearby site. If any uh, nearby site, if the existing site uh, investigation report is available, then also we will collect these things. So, we will collect these things before we start our soil exploration. Then first we will go for the site reconnaissance. So, we will go for the preliminary survey uh, of the land of the site where we will conduct the soil exploration and then we will look at that whether the site access because we have to, uh, we need the uh, access of the site for some uh, for equipments which will be used for soil exploration. So, we will look at the site access, then the topography of the site, then site geology 
and condition of the adjacent structures. So, if uh, structure is uh, very close to the soil exploration site, then you have to take some precaution uh, because uh, during the soil exploration, the noise will be there, some disturbance will be there. So, if that uh, will affect the structure, then you have to take the precaution for that structure also. So, you have to, and then the condition of the structure that you have to study nearby location of the uh, site. Then the methods available for the soil exploration may be classified as the as follows, the direct method, semi-direct methods and indirect methods. Then the direct methods that is a test pit, tile pit or trenches, then semi-direct methods that is boring, indirect method is sounding or penetration test and geophysical methods. So, one by one I will expel, uh, explain all the methods. Then the direct method or the test pit. The test pit or trench are open, open type of accessible exploration, uh, uh, exploration method. So, that means here it is an open trench or open pit, a test pit we construct and then and uh, it will construct at the, at the level of the uh, uh, foundation where you will place that. So, from there we will collect the soil sample. So, that means the soil can be inspected in natural condition. The necessary soil sample may be obtained by sampling techniques and used for finding strength and other engineering properties by appropriate laboratory test. Test pit are uh, considered suitable only for small depth up to 3 meter and cost of these increases rapidly with depth. So, this type of direct method by test pit or trenches is suitable for a very small depth up to 3 meter because we have to construct the trenches up to the uh, at the level where we place the foundation. Now, for greater depth lateral support or bracing of the excavation will be necessary. So, lateral support or bracing system will be necessary if it is depth is high. So, the cost will increase increase rapidly for a higher depth. So, test pit are usually made only for supplementing other methods or for minor structures. Now, semi direct methods or boring. Now, boring making or drilling boreholes into the ground with a view to obtaining soil or rock samples from the specified or known depth is called boring. Now, common method of borings are auger boring, wash boring, rotary drilling and precaution drilling. Now, what is auger boring? Now, the soil auger is a device that is useful for adversing borehole into the ground. Now, this is a typical uh, figure of the uh, auger boring augers. So, this is a post hole bo uh, auger and this is the helical augers and this is the rod which can be attached here to increase the or we can reach up to the required depth and that length of the auger we can increase by putting this rod here. Now, auger may be hand operated or power driven. The hand operated augers are used for relatively small depth less than 3 to 5 meter where the power driven are used for greater depth up to 60 to 70 meter in case of continuous flight augers. The soil auger is advanced by rotating it while pressing it into the soil. As soon as the soil auger gets filled with soil, it is taken out and soil sample is collected. The soil sample obtained from this type of boring are highly disturbed sample because here the sample you are getting which is very highly disturbed. The auger boring is convenient, convenient in case of partially saturated sand, silt, medium to steep cohesive soils. Now, next type of uh, uh, soil exploration or boring uh, technique is shell and auger. So, this is uh, the auger and this is the typical shell and auger photographs. So, it is used widely in India. The shell 
called as a sand baler is a heavy duty pipe with a cutting edge. The shale is raised and left fall into the hole. The soil is cut, entered into the tube which is empty when which is uh, emptied when it is full. That means this is the cutting edge and this is a heavy duty uh, shell. So that is this shell is taken up and then it is fallen into the ground. So this is a valve, one way valve. So it open and the soil enter from here to into the cell. And once it is enter, this valve is closed, it cannot go back. So when this cell is um, filled by the water, uh, the soil, then it is taken out and then soil samples are collected and then again it is put into the borehole. The cell is used when auger boring becomes difficult. Where the auger boring is difficult, then this technique is used. Now next one is the wash boring. You know, wash boring is commonly used for exploration in the below ground water table for which auger method is not suitable. So as, as I mentioned that auger boring is suitable for partially saturated soil. Now, if the soil is completely saturated or below the water, then auger boring is not a, a suitable method. So in that case, we will go for the wash boring. Now this method may be used for all kind of soil except those mixed with gravel or boulders. A casing, a casing pipe is pushed into and driven with a drop hammer. So its casing pipe is pushed into soil and then it is driven with a drop hammer. The hollow drill bit is screwed into the hollow drill rod connected to a rope passing over a pulley and supported by tripod. So that means this is a typical wash boring arrangement. So here this is the um, this casing is uh, this is chopping bit is entered into the soil and this is the um, pulley and this is the tripod and here the soil is uh, collected with the wash tap. This is the drill rod then this is the pump. This is the typical system. So here it is pushed and driven and this into the soil. And the water jet under pressure is forced through the rod and beat into the hole. And therefore, <coughs> this water jet loosens the soil at the lower end and force, forces the soil water suspension upward along with annular surface between the rod and the side hole. And this suspension is then <coughs> collected in a settling tank where soil particles settle where in the water overflow from the uh, tank and the water collected into sump is used for circulation again. So that means the when the soil particles settle down then that soil particle soil is collected for the testing and water is allowed to flow uh, for overflow so that this water can be circulated for the uh, this water can be used for the next uh, for the uh, future uh, boring purpose. So now here as I mentioned that here the water sample which is collected is a mixture of soil and water. So that means the water sample which is collected here is highly disturbed sample. Now the soil particle collected represents a very uh, disturbed sample and is not very useful for evaluating for engineering properties. The wash bearing are primarily used for advancing borehole. Whenever the soil sample is required, the chopping bees is to be replaced by sampler. The change of rate of progress and change of color of wash water indicate changes in soil strata. So that means the color of soil, soil water mixture uh, will give uh, indication that this is the change in soil strata. And as I mentioned that wash boring is giving highly disturbed sample, so it is not suitable for uh, determining the engine properties of the soil. It is basically used for the advancing a borehole. And whenever the soil sample is required, we can replace the bit by soil sampler. Next one is the rotary drilling. The, that can be used for sand, clay and rocks unless badly 
efficient. A drilling bit fixed uh, to the lower end of the drill rod is rotated by power while being kept in firm contact with the hole. Drilling fluid or bentonite slurry is used under pressure through the drill rod and it comes up bringing the cutting of the surface. Even rock cores may be obtained by using suitable diamond drill rod. When soil samples are required, the drill rod raised and drill bit is replaced by the sampler. Next one in the precursion drilling, a heavy drill bit suspended from the drill rod or a cable and is driven into the repeated blows. So water is added to facilitate the breaking of steep rock or soil. The slurry of pulverized material is applied in the out of uh, in certain intervals. The method cannot be used for loose sand and it is slow uh, in plastic clay. The formation gets badly disturbed by impact. So, when you are talking about this, this type of boring and the, all the borings that uh, except the auger borings, uh, the bit, drill rod is there and a bit uh, is attached in front of the drill rod and this drill rod is uh, pushed into the soil and it is driven also. And then uh, this drill bit is uh, helped to uh, advance this uh, rod into the soil or borehole. And then whenever this soil sample is required, this drill bit is replaced by the sampler. Now the type of soil sample, as I mentioned that we, we can get the soil sample in two types. One is disturbed soil sample, another is the undisturbed soil sample. A disturbed sam soil sample is that in which the natural structure of the soil gets modified partly or fully during sampling. An undisturbed sample is that in which the natural structure and other physical properties remain preserved. Now the where the disturbed sample will be, will be used, where the undisturbed sample will be used. The disturbed sample will be used for gain size analysis determination of liquid limit and plastic limit or whatever limits of the soil, specific gravity of the soil solid, organic content determination and soil classification. The soil classification also the disturbed sample will be used. But for the uh, strength properties of the soil that in the uh, strength, shear strength test, then consolidation test, hydraulic conductivity test, in this test undisturbed soil sample must be used. So, that is mandatory because this uh, unless we use the undisturbed soil sample, then these um, properties which we will get from this consolidation test, uh, the hydraulic conductivity or shear strength test that will be required for the foundation design. So, that we should get the properties in, this, in, in soil's natural condition. So, so that is why we need the undisturbed soil sample for this test. Now, for the undisturbed soil samples, some uh, conditions uh, we have to follow that uh, if we get this is the undisturbed soil sample, then what is the requirement, what is the condition will be there. So, required for triaxial consolidation test in lab, that good quality samples are necessary. Now, if this is a sampler tube, so, this is a hollow tube. So, it has a inner diameter, it has a outer diameter also. And the area ratio we can determine from this way that is the outer diameter square minus inner diameter square divided by inner diameter square and it is expressed in percentage. So, here we can determine, we can measure the inner diameter and outer diameter of a sampling tube and then we can determine what would be the area ratio. Now, for a good quality soil sample, this area ratio should be less than 10 percent. Now, thicker the wall of the sampler, this thicker the wall of the sampler tube, greater the disturbance. Then take good care of the transport and handling of the soil sample. Once we collect the soil sample, you have to take care for the transportation and handling of the soil sample, so that the soil do not get disturbed. Now, in the IS code recommendation also, 
So one is area ratio that should be less than 10 percent. In additional uh, to that, IS code recommends few other conditions for the uh, um, undisturbed samples. So here, this is a typical sampler uh, tube figure, and here du1 is the diameter inner diameter of the cutting edge, and d2 is the outer diameter of the cutting edge, and d3 is the inner diameter of the sampler tube, and d4 uh, is the inner diameter outer diameter of this sampler tube. Now uh, inside clearance ci that we can calculate d3 minus d1 divided by d1 percentage uh, into 100. Then outside clearance C0, we can determine D2 minus D4 divided by D4. And the area ratio here we can determine for this type of um, sampler tube is D2 square minus D1 square divided by D1 square. So according to IS 1892-1979, CI should be in between 1 to 3 percent for a good sample collection. And C0 usually lies in between 0 to 2 percent and air should not be greater than about 20 percent for steep formation and wherever, whereas for soft sensitive clay air should be less than equal to 10 percent. So these are the recommendation given by the IS code. Now, degree of disturbance of a cohesive or rock sample can be estimated by recovery ratio also. So now, when we enter in a soil sample into the soil, sampler into the soil, then the recovery ratio is defined as actual length of recovered sample and theoretical length of recovered sample. So that means how much soil sample we can what would be the length of the soil sample we, we have collected through the sampler that length uh, this is the actual recover length of the sample and theoretical length is the total length of the soil sampler. So this is the ratio. Now for LR equal to 1 means recover length of the sample is equal to the length of the sampler was forced into the stratum. So that means if theoretical length of the recover sample is equal is equal to the actual length of the recover sample, then this is LR is equal to 1. So that means the if the length of the soil sample we have collected that is equal to the length of the soil sampler that we have pushed into the soil sample, into the soil sample to collect the sample into the soil. So that length of the sampler is equal to the length of the soil sample we have collected then that LR ratio will be 1 and LR is, is if LR is equal to 1 that indicates a good recovery and if LR is less than 1 indicates the soil is compressed and if LR is greater than 1 which indicates the soil has swelled. So a good sample collection of sample will be that one where LR is equal to 1. Otherwise, either soil is compressed if LR is less than 1 or it is swelled if LR is greater than 1. So, both are a disturbance is there in these two cases, whereas if LR is equal to 1, which is less disturbance is there. So, that means the what are the different types of soil samplers? So, what are the different types of soil samplers? So, the two types of soil samplers, one is thick wall samplers that is a split spoon samplers, another is thin wall samplers where it is shell by tubes. Now split spoon samplers is uh, a driven shoe attached to the lower end serves as the cutting edge. So this is the typical um, sampler tube, so here is the cutting edge, uh, this is for the split spoon sampler and a sample head may be screwed at the upper end of the split spoons. The standard size of split spoon sampler is 30 mm internal diameter and 50.8 mm external diameter. So this is 50.8 is the external diameter and 
35 millimeter is the internal diameter. The sample is lowered to the bottom of the borehole by attach the drill rod. The sampler is then driven in by forcing into the soil by blow from the hammer. So, sampler is attached with a sample drill rod and then drill rod is the sampler is placed at a required depth. Then hammer is applied on the uh, drill rod so that the sample uh, sampler tube can be pushed into the soil. So, once the, the sampler is pushed into the soil, then the um, assembly of the sampler is extracted from the holes, then it is taken out from the hole and, and the cutting edge and coupling at top are unscrewed. The two halves of the barrels are separated and sample is then collected. The samples are generally taken at interval of 1.53 meter or 5, uh, 5 feet. So, once it, this soil sample is pushed into the uh, sampler, is pushed into the soil sample, then after that it is taken out and soil is entered into the soil sampler. So, once it is taken out, then it is basically a two halves uh, hollow tube. So, it is, uh, it is opened and then soil sample is collected inside the tube. Now, as I uh, mentioned that the external diameter of the soil sample is uh, sampler, this fish spoon sampler is 50.8 and internal diameter is 35 millimeter. So, what would be the area ratio? That is 50.8 square minus 30 4.9 or close to 35 uh, millimeter or it is close to 35 actually 34.9 millimeter. So, that is the area ratio is 112 percentage whereas, for the um, good sample the area ratio should be equal to or less than 10 percent, but it is 112 percent. So, the split spoon sampler is highly disturbed the sample which is collected by split spoon sampler is highly disturbed sample. Now, when the material encounter in the field is sand, so that means here we are talking about that we will get the sample from the split spoon sampler, it is, it is suitable for the standard one, it is suitable for the clay soil. Now, if we encounter for the sandy soil, then a partially fine sand below the water table, a, a device such as spring core catcher is placed inside the split spoon. So, that means this is the spring core catcher which is placed, this is the normal split spoon sampler which is used for the clay soil and if it is sandy soil or below the water table then a split spoon, uh, this is the spring core catcher, this one is fixed in this split uh, sampler, split spoon sampler. Now, the thin wall uh, that was the previous one is the split spoon sampler or thick wall sampler, uh, this is the thin oil wild uh, sampler tube the commonly used to obtain undisturbed clay sample. So, previous one is obtained for disturbed sample because there the area ratio is 112 percent, but here this is this commonly used for undisturbed clay sample. The outside diameter is 50.8 millimeter and 76.3 millimeter the two types of samples. The sampler with a 50.8 millimeter outside diameter has an inside diameter of about 47.63 millimeter. So, then the area issue is uh, coming out to be 13.75 percentage, which is very close to 10 percent. So, that means the uh, for the good uh, undisturbed soil sample collection, the area issue should be around 10 percent or less than that. So, here it is around 13 or 14 percentage which is close to 10. So, this is generally used for the collection of undisturbed clay samples. So, this is a typical thin oil sampler uh, photographs or which is used for the collecting undisturbed sample. Now, how many bore holes will, uh, will decide that for a particular site? how many boreholes will be there, how will decide, so that the number of boreholes depend on the type and size of the project. 
now budget of the site investigation and soil variability now if the type and size of the project depending upon that will decide how much what is the number of borehole will from where we will take the soil sample now, if the site investigation budget is more then we can definitely go for a higher number of boreholes and if the budget is less then you have to go for the lesser number of boreholes and if the soil variability if the soil variability the soil variability in different boreholes as is uh, is very uh, very much then we have to decide then we can we should increase the number of boreholes for a particular site so locate the boreholes where lower loads are expected then the spacing of boreholes so initially was the number of boreholes then the spacing of boreholes then the depending upon the uh, type of project so what is the spacing what the, that the multi storied buildings the spacing should be 10 to 10 meter and 10 to 30 meters or there is one story industrial plants 20 to 60 meter highways it is 250 to 500 meters residential subdivisions 250 to 500 meters and dam and dikes 40 to 80 meters so this is the typical spacing can be used for different type of structures now the depth of boreholes what would be the minimum depth of boreholes so then five, first we have discussed the number of boreholes then the spacing of boreholes now the depth of borehole up to what depth we will collect the soil sample so that is very important issue or generally the, the influence zone of a foundation is, foundation is generally taken as the twice of the width of the foundation so that is the thumb rule that the twice of the width of the foundation is generally is taken as the influence zone so that but there are some recommendations there by which we can determine what would be the minimum depth of the boring so first one is the given by ac 1972 here so suppose this is a foundation and this is the depth of the uh, borehole from the ground now here first determine the net increase of stress under the foundation so net increase what is the increment of stress due to this applied load at the foundation level so at the foundation if we applied load what would be the net increment of stress at different depth so that we can calculate and for this calculation uh, various uh, equations are available so and in the later on when you calculate the settlement or then we will um, we'll show how to calculate this increment of the stress uh, due to the applied load at different level so that is the net increase in the stress then estimates the variation of vertical effective stress with depth so that means here we can see the vertical stress effective stress will increase as we will go in depth so that means uh, with depth it is increasing and for the net increment of the stress is decreasing with depth so this is the vertical effective stress that is increasing and this is the net increment of the stress due to the applied external load and that is decreasing with the depth now determine the depth d is equal to d1 at which stress increase delta sigma is equal to q by 10 where q is the estimated net stress on the foundation now here what is q q is the net stress applied at foundation level that is q and then we determine the depth d1 at which this net increment of the stress del sigma is one tenth of the net stress applied at foundation level so we determine that depth as a d1 then we determine the depth d is equal to d2 at which the ratio net increment of stress divided by effective vertical stress is equal to 0 0.05 so that means we will determine that depth also here we will get this condition now unless bedrock is encountered the smaller of two depths d1 and d2 
will be the approximate minimum depth of boring required. If we encounter the bedrock in between these two, then we have to go for the to the bedrock, then that is okay. But if the bedrock is not encountered, then smaller of these two depths will give you give us the approximate minimum required depth of boring. Now, another way and that uh, we can get this, the depth of boring by this recommendation, uh, we, uh, uh, boring for a building with a width of 100 feet or 30.5 meter, that for the, for this is a one particular case which is uh, shown here, that uh, your, the number of stories, if it is one, then the boring depth is 3.5 meter and if the number of stories is 2, then the boring may, uh, depth is 6 meter. If number of stories is 3, then the boring depth is 10 meter. If number of stories is 4, then 16 meter. If it is 5, then it is 24 meter. So, this is a typical example is shown here. Now, depth of boring according to IS code. So, according to IS code, what would be the depth of boring? So, that is IS 1892-1979. So, according to that, what would be the depth of boring? Now, if the type of foundation, if it is an isolated spread footing or raft, the depth of boring will be one and a half times of the width of the foundation. Then this is the minimum required of the depth of boring for the isolated spread footing or a foundation. This is 1.5 times the width of the foundation. Now, if adjacent footing with clear spacing less than the twice of the width, then also one and a half times the length of the footing. Then if it is a pile and oil foundation, then to a depth of one and half times the width of the structure from the toe of the pile of the bottom of the well. So, that means the from the bearing level. So, if it is a pile or well foundation the to a depth of one and half times the width of the structures from the bearing level or the, that is the toe of pile or bottom of the oil. For example, that if it is a pile foundation, so this is a pile foundation and say this is pile cap. So, generally it is saying that if this is the width of the structural width of the pile cap, then from this bearing we can go 1.5 times with the width of the structure that is from the toe of the pile or bottom of the well will go. So, that will be the minimum required depth of the boring. And this also has uh, this depending upon the type of the soil also this depth will change. So, later on in the calculation of pile settlement we will see that up to which, which will be the influence zone up to which depth depending upon the different types of soil. So, influence zone where it will take up to which depth will take the influence zone that will also change. So, but the th typical rule is that width of the structure is B, then from the bottom of the pile or well go up to 1.5 times of the width. Then next one is the road cut that uh, equal to the bottom uh, width of the cut and then fill, if it is a fill then 2 meters below the ground level or equal to the height of the field whichever is greater. 
then uh, we have some other condition also that is the IS code also recommends some um, other conditions of the depth of the boring. So, the, if this is two uh, building structures or uh, if this is width of the one uh, width is B and another one is B and there is a gap A. Now, if L is greater than equal to B, then depth of the boring will be 1.5 times of the B for A equal to greater than equal to 4 B. So, this is an another one depth of boring is 1.5 times of L for A is less than twice of B. So, this is one condition. Now, these are the some uh, building uh, dimension or building blocks are there and uh, this is the total with W this one L is equal to W, this width is B, this spacing is A, again B, A, B. Now, depth of boring will be 4.5 times of the B for A less than twice B and depth of B um, boring will be 3 times of B for A greater than twice B <coughs> and less than 4 B and depth of boring will be 1.5 times of B for A greater than or equal to 4 B. The next one is the, uh, we should know the location of the uh, water table also. As I mentioned, the location of water table uh, is also a very important issue because we should know that what would be the location of a particular water table because as the position of the water table changes, the load carrying capacity of the foundation or the soil, then the settlement of the soil that will also change. So, before we design the foundation, we should know what would be the uh, or location, what, what is the location of the water table. Now, to locate the water table, the correct indication of ground water table level is found by allowing the water in a bore, boring to reach a equilibrium level. So, that means for how we will get the location of the boring, so uh, water table. So, we can uh, construct a borehole and then we can pour water into the borehole and allow this water to settle down. So, that in the correct indication is the uh, after some time we will get the water table will reach a equilibrium condition. So, that water within the borehole will reach a equilibrium condition. So, after that there will be no change of the water level. So, that equilibrium condition or equilibrium level will indicate that that is the level of the water table. Now, if the sandy soil, if the soil is sandy soil the level gets stabilized very quickly within a few hours at most. But if it is a clay soil, for the sandy soil this water will take the equilibrium condition very quickly that means within an hour. But if it is a clay soil, then it take, it may take a day, many days for this purpose. Hence, the stand pipe or piezometer are used in clay and sand. So, for the previous method that you know, is suitable for the sandy soil because it takes very, very less time say few hours, but if it is a clay soil or silty soil then it takes very long time say many days. So, that is why that method is not suitable for the clay or in that case the piezometer or stand pipes are used to determine the location of the water table. So, in this way we can determine the various engineering properties for, but uh, today's class I have discussed about only uh, uh, the discuss the uh, direct method and semi direct method. I have not discussed about the indirect method or uh, indirect method that means the penetration test or geophysical exploration. So, those things will be explained in the next class. So, today's class we have discussed about the um, uh, direct methods and the 
uh, semi-direct methods then what are the different types of soil samples so what are the different types of soil samples that is the disturbed soil samples and undisturbed soil samples so where we will use those soil samples so that means it is that means we will get in the boring uh, methods or uh, semi-direct method we will get all the dist uh, uh, disturbed samples so where you will use those disturbed samples so that means the determination of some properties say index properties or uh, the um, soil classification we can use the disturbed sample but if it is in case of strength properties or the uh, consolidation properties or the hydraulic conductivity test in that case we cannot use the disturbed sample in that case use of undisturbed sample is compulsory we should use the undisturbed sample in those cases because those properties are very important for foundation design next one is that how we will get the disturbed sample, undisturbed sample, how we will collect the undisturbed sample, what is the condition of a, a collecting of good quality soil sample. So, for the good quality soil sample, we should uh, use the sampler tube whose area ratio is less than or equal to 10 percent. And I score also have recommended some other conditions, so those things have already been explained in this class, so in this lecture. So, that means we should use a soil sampler whose area ratio is less than or equal to 10 percent and generally for the sampler there are two types of samplers are used one is uh, thick wall uh, sampler tube that is a split spoon sampler another is thin wall or cell wide tubes and as it is expected that if we increase the thickness of the sampler tube because sampler tube is a hollow uh, tube if we increase the thickness there will be more disturbance. So, in the split pool sampler tubes have, as uh, uh, have seen that the area ratio is 112 percent. So, if we use the uh, split pool sampler tube to collect the soil sample, then that soil sample will be a very highly disturbed sample because where the area ratio is 112 percent. So, whereas if we use the thin oil or oil uh, sampler tube or the shell by tube there the area ratio is around 10 percent that is 13.75 percent for a particular case. So, that means that tube we can that sampler tube we can use for collecting the undisturbed so, uh, uh, collecting undisturbed soil sample for clay. Now, the question is that, one, that once you collect the soil sample, then what would be the number of boreholes that we have to also decide. So, uh, so where we will, so that the first uh, condition is the where the maximum load is expected, we have to locate our borehole there. And again, the what would be the number of borehole? That depends on the type of structure for which you are doing the uh, soil exploration then the budget of the soil exploration. If budget is more, we can um, uh, collect, we can provide more uh, boreholes and if the budget is less, then we, we can provide, we have to go for the lesser amount of the uh, number of boreholes. And another issue is the soil variability. So, if the variation of the soil sample is more in different boreholes, then it is required to use more boreholes in the uh, proposed area so that we can get the proper soil properties of the lo that location. So, once we decide the number of boreholes, next we will decide the spacing of boreholes, what would be the required spacing of. So, there also we have discussed some guidelines for different types of structure or different type of uh, construction, what will be the minimum spacing between the boreholes. Next one is the very important issue is the depth of the boreholes, up to what depth we will go for our soil sampling. So, that also depending the type of structure we are constructing over there and what would be the width of the structure and the based on that width we can determine what would be the required minimum depth of the boreholes. And again, for that purpose also, we have uh, 
explain, I have explained one uh, um, recommendation proposed by AC by which also we can determine which will be the minimum requirement of the depth of the borehole. Another one some typical example for a particular 100 feet width of building for different number of as the number of stories increases the depth of borehole is also increasing. So, that is also be explained there. The next one another for the IS code recommendation also is given. The so typically for a foundation if it is a width is B say then the depth of borehole if it is a shallow foundation or rap foundation say if it is a depth width of the foundation is B then typical minimum depth of the boreholes is varies from 1.5 times to 2 times of the width. So, that means the generally it is uh, taken up to 2 times of the width of the foundation soil is influenced by the uh, by the stress which is coming from the uh, foundation that in the external loading. And generally when you design the foundation we will design for the two criteria. One is for the bearing capacity criteria and uh, another is a settlement criteria. Now, for the bearing capacity criteria we take the soil properties up to the twice B up to the B sorry. For the bearing capacity uh, calculation purpose we take it is up to the B of the um, up to the B of the soil layer. So, that means so, here if B is the width of the foundation, then we take the soil properties of depth below the foundation level up to the width B. So, depth is equal to B. So, up to that portion we take the soil properties for the bearing capacity calculation. But for the settlement calculation, generally we take the depth of the found soil depth up to the depth of the uh, soil layer below the uh, foundation base is equal to twice of the width of the foundation. So, in that way we can um, so that means up at least up to twice of the uh, width of the foundation you have to go for the um, depth of boring and for the that is for the shallow foundation and for the deep, found, deep foundation for pile or for the well foundation again you have to go for the 1.5 times to 2 times of the width of the structure, but that is from the base of the pile or tip of the pile or below the well of the found well up to 1.5 or twice the width of the structure. So, that way we can determine and also IS code has recommended some guidelines so those things also been explained in this lecture the what would be the minimum depth of the boring. And then the next one is the location of the water table that is also very important issue. So, that means we should also uh, should know that what would be the location of the water table. So, these are the things very important for the soil exploration. So, we know should know these things before we start the foundation design. So, in the next class I will explain in the lecture to what uh, uh, the uh, indirect method that means the penetration test and then the geophysical explorations. Thank you. Mm -hmm.